Welcome everybody to the Movie Mechanics Podcast. I am Sam, the Movie Mechanic, and today I am joined by an internet legend, actor, writer, comedian, Hal Rudnick, was a member of the legendary Screen Junkies team for several years, where he once took a paper bag off Shia LaBeouf's head. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, Hal hosts the hilarious series Tournament of Nerds and Character House, which you can find on Twitch and YouTube. Make some noise. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you guys reaching out. And uh, wow, what an intro. What an intro. That was uh, delightful. Hey, are you still living with your mom? Sam, you know, that's uh, that is a, you are referring to a character uh, that I, uh, I have played uh, on the internet and um, in sketch comedy for m- yeah. uh, many years. That is uh, one Eric Jennifer, the good boy of comedy. And he he still lives with his mom. He still I, lives with his mom. Uh, I thankfully am happily married, living with my wife uh, here in Los Angeles. And uh, but uh, I, I was I did visit my mom on the East Coast actually last week, and I had a very delightful visit. That's wonderful. Yeah, I I remember watching you do a lot of interviews and and a lot of bits with your mom. Like the, one of my favorites was watching porn with your mom or something watching r-rated movies with your mom oh yes uh not like just shy of porn um di- didn't quite go there but we did watch 50 shades of gray together uh which is you know some might call softcore porn but it is it's 50 shades is more like anticipation porn because it's just like it's it's kind of a those movies are not great and they're pretty dull until they get to the racy parts and even the racy parts are a little yeah so it was, that was cr- you know, it was just fun to watch cringy stuff with my mom and see how she would react. And, uh, you know, all for uh, all for the fans. And my mom was a really great sport about uh, doing those things with me. And uh, we also watched uh, Human Centipede <laughs> together, <laughs> which was, yeah, a r- interesting viewing with one's mother. Right. Yeah, there's... We saw a movie together last week. We went and saw uh, James Bond, No Time to Die together. And... Uh, uh, I thought it was a little too long, but I enjoyed it. Uh, She really liked it uh, and it kept her awake. And my mom easily falls asleep. And especially at two hours and 43 minutes, she stayed awake through the whole thing. So I I, I applaud her for that. Yeah, that's great. I I enjoyed that movie too. Um, Now, speaking of movies, you you are like a movie review veteran. Um, Is it fair to say you're a movie buff? Yes, absolutely. My dad gave me a very, like a huge education on classic cinema growing up. Uh, And so much, it was like, some of it was under duress in as much as when kids want to go out and play, like I want to go out and play wiffle ball or just ride bikes in the neighborhood. My dad's like, sit down, we're watching 1957's Shane directed by George Stevens, starring Alan Ladd. And uh, so at the time I was like, oh no, I wanna go outside. And then a lot of these movies were black and white. But now I really appreciate the foundation that he laid. And then after that, I went to film school and I've always just had a a passion for movies since I was, yeah, really young and it continues to this day. So are movies movies getting better or are they getting worse in your opinion? That's a great question. So I wonder, you know, not to sound too Martin Scorsese here, but I wonder about the effect that streaming is having on movies. And then the fact that so many movies are going direct, you know, direct to streaming, direct to TV. I mean, not, listen, people aren't trying to make, people don't set out to make bad movies. Uh, usually, uh, unless it's like so bad it's good or kind of like a hate watch movie or something weird. But I feel like, you know, we get a lot of just like quickly churned out content in the age of living in now or movies that are trying to capitalize on trends as well. So I think, you know, we do have like a lot of bad movies filling up streaming services. But at the same time, you still get gems. There are still great movies that are released because you have you know, smart people 
and people who care about creating good stuff still making movies. So that's a, I feel like there's a lot of gray area in that question. In some respects, yes, but in some respects, no. Because whereas I talk about, you know, I was just hitting streaming services as far as like having a lot of bad content, but on the flip side, without streaming services, we wouldn't have as much access to documentary films as we have. And like, we live in a golden age, like, and that I think some of that is largely thanks to streaming services. Like before Netflix came along with like making a murderer and the keepers and then HBO and HBO max with uh, the jinx and other like high profile docu series and documentary films uh, you wouldn't have had as much access. And now Netflix, HBO Max, Hulu are treasure troves of documentary films. Sure. And so that's a really good thing. So yeah, little little column A, little column B. <laughs> yeah, I have one movie in particular. I hope you're familiar with it. It's called Samurai Cop. Um, that sounds familiar, but I don't think I've seen it. It's one of the worst movies ever produced. <laughs> in history um but i look at it as it's kind of a, a give and take because while you look at the state of film i mean this movie came out in 1990 but you look at the state of film you say how could anyone allow such a movie to be made but at the same time it's inspirational because if that got made anything could get made right yeah i watched uh sometimes on my twitch channel I'll do movie watch alongs. And uh, because it was spooky season in October, I, I did some horror watch alongs and one movie like Samurai Cop, just that name. And I'm imagining what it was, uh, reminded me of this one movie we watched called Killer Sofa. And it was about a, well, first of all, it was a misnomer because it wasn't a sofa. It was like a lazy boy love seat. That's not a sofa, right? Oh. Like one of those reclining lazy boys. Yeah. So it was a misnomer to begin with. And uh, it was so bad. It was so like laughably bad. Uh, Had and, to have been based on a nightmare of Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse, right? It's great. Yeah. Because Cherry, the, uh, the, 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 the funny <clears throat> talking, excuse me, the talking chair. <laughs> Uh, someone, as we were doing it, like dropped a picture into the chat of uh, of the that blue, that light blue aqua colored chair. And um, yeah, that's the evil, uh, Killer Sofa is the evil twin of Cherry. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, one of my favorite videos of all time, and I'm not talking about just your videos, but of all time, wow. is you sitting in a room basically talking at Shia LaBeouf, right? Oh, so surreal. <laughs> Such a great video. I mean, it's not only an indictment of kind of the self-absorption of a celebrity run amok, mm -hmm. but also the celebrity or the, the obsession that people have with celebrity, the, the line out the door of this, this little art house where people are leaving their kids at home so they can come stand in line and see Shia LaBeouf sit in a room with a bag on his head. Yep. And that was uh, one of the, the most impressive videos. Um, and I just have a question. Have you forgiven Shia LaBeouf for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? Oh boy. N no, like that movie, it's like, you know, like, and we talk about uh, cancel culture and like canceling people and stuff. I want to cancel that movie. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> it's a blight. It's a blight on the, on the, the, the more, what would have been a, just a, a, a seamless record for uh, the Indiana Jones flicks. I mean, some are a couple, you know, some people knock Temple of Doom and Temple of Doom is like a little, you know, I guess it, it, some parts haven't aged that well, but th those those three movies are just damn good times. And then that fourth one, it's like, what is happening? And, but they're coming back. They're going to take another drink from the, the chalice. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, so I, I look forward to Harrison Ford you know, donning the, the leather jacket and taking out the whip yeah. <laughs> again. So we'll see. But yeah, and Shia LaBeouf's a tough case as well, because I, I really started to um, c come to like 
really respect a lot of his choices and like Honey Boy and uh, Peanut Butter Falcon were really good films from uh, the past couple of years. But then just all these allegations come out and that's, I hate to see it. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a real bummer. Seems like that, that guy has to like, you know, as many of us do, but that he has a lot of work to do on himself and it's unfortunate to see. Uh, how, how did you yeah. end up doing that video at his little art house piece? Yeah, we just came to, uh, we, we found the information that he was doing this art installation and it's not too far from where the offices of Screen Junkies are or were previously in Los Angeles. So we're like, yeah, let's go down there and see if we can uh, get in there. And I wore a little uh, kind of spy cam glasses and uh, <laughs> and the rest is what you see on that on that video there. And it was... Uh, it, it was nerve wracking and awkward, uh, but I'm glad we I'm glad we were getting able to get a video out of it. And yeah, my favorite part is you showing him old clips of even Stevens. Uh, <laughs> man. That's uh, so great. Yeah, it's 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 all a blur at this point, but uh, yeah, that was um, that that was fun and nerve wracking. And uh, thank you for to the uh, everyone who was a good sport and. Uh, allowed me help me uh move up in the line and just get in there because they were going to close down the exhibit and we almost didn't get in uh to ask him some questions so I'm, I'm glad we were able to make it happen hilarious speaking of hilarious um you were on america's got talent as your mm. character eric jennifer the the good boy of comedy as we yes as we mentioned um what was the inspiration for that character you know, I've been doing versions of that character. Um, Eric Jennifer, the good boy of comedy. Good job. Good job. Make some noise and uh, thumbs up. And uh, That character, it's a little bit like just like my, I, I would have to describe it as my inner child becoming my outer child. <laughs> so like, and really just like, you know, someone who's like uh, innocent, but like, extremely honest to a fault and calling it calling out like everything that he sees and who's from uh something that he has in uh in common with me a little bit of a dysfunctional uh um upbringing at certain points and uh and yeah just like my inner child like coming up to life and uh, doing stand-up comedy. His backstory is that he lives with his mother in uh, an apartment complex in Gardena, California. One of his one of the first lines uh, I say uh, in the um, in my stand-up act as Eric Jennifer is, "So, did anyone drive here tonight?" And then a lot of people clap and make some noise, and then I say, "Oh, can I get a ride to Gardena?" <laughs> and he's uh uh and i started doing the first version of eric jennifer i think i started doing in like improv shows in college then an incarnation of him came to life probably about 15 20 years ago doing sketch comedy and then i had uh, a long-running sketch comedy group called the midnight show we've got a lot of videos on youtube and we've we've toured the country and we did 10 years of sold out shows at the upright citizens brigade theater in los angeles and he started to become a regular fixture there and a real he became a crowd favorite and i started doing stand up as him and doing it all over and then i got uh uh noticed by someone who books america's got talent and <clears throat> pardon me that was a cool really cool experience a very also surreal um like being up on stage and judged by simon cowell i can check that off the bucket list but it was it was a you know a lot of mixed feelings about that because i got to do two performances but they only aired one of the performances and the second one and the second one was uh kind of a mixed bag and they they put up a really short edited version of it. The first performance, man, Eric Jennifer did great. Eric Jennifer, uh, dare I say, Eric Jennifer crushed. And the, but they didn't air it because Eric Jennifer, is a, he, he gets a little raw. Like he likes to say things, like he talks about just dysfunctional upbringing. And like, um, so, and I made up this whole backstory, like his, his mom, like he has to wash his, 
he clips his mom's toenails and his grandpa, uh, like he has a, a really mean, like grandpa with a horrible temper, like stuff about his grandpa um, throwing a manhole cover through a Quiznos window <laughs> and, and stuff like, like insane crap. And so I, I think they were a little hesitant to put like this dark family stuff uh, from Eric Jennifer. I mean, that's like, because the, one of the producers I was working with on America's Got Talent said, oh yeah, the network said, be careful with some of this be careful with this guy or something. So I think that's why the first one didn't air, even though um, it, I got uh, sent through to the next round and uh, the audience loved it. Uh, but uh, overall, just a, a crazy experience. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. It was a, uh, it was really uh, just a, uh, yeah, surreal to have gone through that. That's awesome. Uh, you know, so it sounds like it was a production decision to have Eric Jennifer go on instead of just Hal Rudnick, right? Oh, no, because I wanted to, like, I didn't want to be myself. I was just that character. Mm. It was like, so trying to kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, fool the audience, like playing a character, kind of like, you know, I don't want to comp compare myself to one of the greats uh, ever, but, uh, you know, Andy Kaufman, like Andy Kaufman would do these, uh, like immerse himself in like a character, like Tony, uh, what was it? Tony uh, Heathcliff, Tony Clifton, Tony Clifton was the Andy Kaufman character. If you remember uh, either him playing it, or if you remember from man on the moon sure. uh, and uh, played by Jim Carrey. Uh, yeah. The Tony Clifton character was played by Andy Kaufman and he'd, uh, he'd lose himself in this kind of this Hollywood uh, kind of lecherous, debaucherous comedian. And uh, so that uh, I guess Eric Jennifer is my version of that. And that's all I wanted to be known as for the show. So it was my decision uh, just to go as Eric Jennifer. So people would believe the character. Yeah. Now Eric's catchphrase was make some noise. Right? Make some noise. <laughs> and also good job, uh, <laughs> hashtag good job. And then if you go to Giphy or if you go to GIFs on your phone and if you search uh, Eric Jennifer or, um, or uh, also maybe hashtag good job, but definitely if you search Eric Jennifer, some gifts will come up of Eric Jennifer saying, like giving a thumbs up and saying good job or like uh, other stuff. That's great. And he, he was just a total weirdo. Like he'd do uh, stuff like, uh, you know, he got a job delivering pizzas, but he didn't own a car. So he would take the bus to deliver the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what would be your catchphrase? And is there a chance it's actual cannibals Shia LaBeouf? <laughs> um so i don't know if it would be that maybe that would be second but you know i liked uh, i had a catchphrase uh uh for uh screen junkies uh what every time i'd at, at the end of every show uh my just sign off would be bye bye yeah bye bye um so on the spot right now i'm i am the bye bye man <laughs> When the it comes, bye -bye to, man. yeah. If you remember that awful horror movie from a few right. years ago. but uh, so I, for many years I was the Bye Bye Man at Screen Junkies, um, or uh, you know, there are many other contenders for possible catchphrases. I was a Boy Scout for several years in my life, and uh, so do a good turn daily. That's a little boring. That's a little boring. It's a little corny, but um, but uh, you know that comes to mind. Also, my mom gave me a strong piece of advice. My I was talking to my mom, and uh, she said. Here's a piece of advice. Don't get old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just die young, right? <laughs> I guess so, because just the, the aches and the pains and just the, the, the nonsense you have to deal with once you get old. So, yeah, maybe that's my catchphrase. Hi, I'm Hal Rudnick. Remember, don't get old. <laughs> yeah, that, die no, that, young while you have the chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a little dark. I don't know if, uh, you know what? I'm going to hold off. I'm going to be yeah. noncommittal. May, maybe stick with bye-bye. You know what, Sam? I'm going to stick with bye-bye. Sounds good. So you've got a couple of streaming shows you're hosting right now. Uh, Tournament of Nerds is a comedy show. Uh, did you come up with that? Yeah, I uh, I came up with the idea and then developed it. And it was really uh, co-created uh, by myself and my good friend, Justin Donaldson. And it's another show I'd mentioned the upright. We started doing that show at the UCB and um, Man, we started doing that show about 12 years ago and we did it at the UCB and then we did it at this amazing comic book shop 
in Los Angeles called The Meltdown. And we did the first ever show at The Meltdown. And it was like three hours long. And it was like Fight Club in this back room, but Fight Club for nerds. It was people debating essentially which character would win in a fight. And, you know, uh, Batman versus Robocop or uh, uh, Superman uh, versus... Uh, and you, you had weird ones. You had battles that like where the underdog beat like someone who you thought automatically would have won. Like the bionic woman beat Spider-Man. Wow. Uh, oh, Predator. Predator beat Superman. Yeah. So, oh, and the guy defending Predator, he did such an amazing job because, uh, you know, a lot of people are just like, here's what my character would do or like they take on the persona of the character, like, oh, well, I would defeat him this way. Or, but the guy defending Predator did it kind of like, um, like Atticus Finch from, uh, or like a Southern lawyer, a small town Southern lawyer from like To Kill a Mockingbird or something. And he was like, listen, my client, the Predator, he, all I know is that he is a killing machine he and like and he just blew us away and he's wearing like a what looked like a white linen suit with like a white um like fedora and he looked every bit uh the part of <laughs> the southern lawyer so he, he crushed it so tournament of nerds it started there and then we we We've done it at San Diego Comic-Con. We've done it at other cons across the country. And we um, had a, a, a show on the Nerdist for a little while doing it there. And it was, it's also become very, it's also come very close to being a TV show a couple of times. And, uh, but either way, my buddy, Justin, who I created it with, and I just have a great time doing it. Now we're doing it on Twitch and you can find my Twitch at uh, twitch.tv slash Hal Rudnick. And Tournament of Nerds has just been a blast. And we're really lucky to have such a great group of comedy folks who are like have massive pop culture and nerd knowledge, but are also funny as hell. And it's just a great combo. And now the, the this has become, it's a, it's a little bit more comedy than, but it's also very nerdy, but the matchups, it can literally be anything, real people or fictional characters. So you'll have like Kim Jong-un versus Darth Vader mm. or uh, Oprah versus Daenerys Targaryen, the mother of dragons. It just depends. And um, the, so the matchups, and they get really crazy. You'll have stuff like, Mr. Peanut versus Thanos. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe like Mr. Peanut will have an amazing argument about like Thanos had the snap, but I target people with peanut allergies. <laughs> and so, and it's become a little less of who would win in a fight and more about just who's funnier. Right. And, and um, it's a really entertaining show. I, I, always have a good time with that and now you've got this other show character house which is a series where you basically beg for sponsorships right oh i absolutely <laughs> do that um i like <clears throat> i i i always i come on and i tell people please uh we were looking for a sponsor for our lightly viewed Twitch show. <laughs> and, um, and, but one of my main, uh, things that I will, I say is, I will, if you sponsor this show, not only will I do a wonderful job of singing the praises and representing your product, but I will talk mad crap on any of your competitors. <laughs> so like if it's a, so if it's a burger place, oh, I will talk about how all the other burger places have rat feces in their, in their food. <laughs> and uh, I will, I will libel them. Yeah. I will put myself in legal jeopardy to help your company. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so what's the secret to managing all this, this amazing crew, this amazing um, log or catalog of comedians that you have working for you on these, on these shows? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is, Sam. I've been fortunate to, to meet so many talented people and uh, be able to call on them to lend their talents. And I think a large part of it is just, you know, I 
I love and respect, and I've been a huge part of the comedy community in Los Angeles for a long time. And additionally, I teach. I teach uh, performance and writing at the UCB Theater. And uh, we've been, even through the pandemic, we've been doing online classes and th they've still been going strong. And I've been having a lot of fun with that and maintaining. So I've been teaching, I've been performing comedy in LA for a good 20 years. And I've been teaching for close to 15 uh, wow. years now. And so that has helped me make so many relationships with people that are kind of like, you know, just up and comers and hungry and, and like super talented. And then I have um, students who have gone on to do awesome stuff. Like I've, I got to teach Chloe Feynman, who's uh, an amazing star of Saturday Night Live now, and she is just out of control. So good. Um, one of my early improv students, and I'm not going to take credit for like any of his success, but I got to uh, I got to teach Randall Park, who mm -hmm. um, he uh, people might uh, know from uh, um, uh, Scarlet Witch from uh, 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 WandaVision, and um, and then I've got to work with just so many other cool people. I got to I've gotten to work with uh, uh, wrestling fans might know uh, uh, John Morrison from the WWE. I got to, uh, he was in one of my classes, so I've gotten to meet uh, so many cool, funny, talented people. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the keys because just being on that end and being able to work with students and having you know just respect for the stuff that they're doing has helped me being able to cast the different projects and bring in funny people to work with. And I'm, I'm super fortunate to be able to uh, call upon just a great group of folks. Well, that is excellent. Um, before we wrap it up, you mentioned that you have your Twitch channel. Is there anywhere else that people can find you? Yeah. Uh, so I actually, uh, I have a podcast and uh, on my podcast, we uh, talk about what's going on in streaming, what's new, uh, what movies are, uh, TV shows, et cetera, on your Hulus, your HBO Maxes, and Netflix. It's called Binge Boys. You can find Binge Boys co-hosted by myself and my pal Lon Harris. You might know Lon Harris from Screen Junkies. Uh, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, then otherwise, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Hal Rudnick and on Twitch, it's twitch.tv slash Hal Rudnick. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time and look forward to all the amazing things you're doing. Sam, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me and uh, yeah, enjoy. And uh, let me, uh, I'll leave you with my catchphrase. Bye-bye. <laughs>